right, next I wanted to talk about the IPCC, which stands for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, it is an international group of scientists and governmental representatives from 130 different countries. And they review all the scientific evidence for climate change. And they put out a report every few years that summarizes um, the science of climate change from all over the world. They try to look through every paper um, on climate change and they try to um, summarize the evidence both globally and look at predictions. They look at um, any progress that's being made to make changes. And then they also look at it region by region. So it looks at the evidence for changes that we see um, in different regions of the world. And this is a really important um, organization that provides the most robust summary of the current data. Um, and they're very careful to say when they feel like there is a lot of evidence and that we're relatively certain about something. And they are very quick to qualify things where there's only a little bit of evidence that right now we think things are um, happening in this way, but we need more information to be sure. So they try to um, put the level of uncertainty. Um, and science has uncertainty, and I think we've learned that from um, the COVID pandemic is that sometimes we're learning things as they go and it's important to update your information, update your ideas as soon as you have um, more robust information on something. And so that's exactly what the IPCC tries to do with its reports. They report that um, projects warming of 1 to 6 degrees Celsius by 2100, and they think the best estimate is 2 to 4 degrees Celsius. So they're telling you um, the range of possibilities is 1 to 6, but most likely, based on the data we have, that it will be between 2 and 4 degrees Celsius, which is about 3 to 8 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can imagine 8 degrees Fahrenheit sounds like a lot for an average to go up. Um, and just for perspective, there's only been a five degree Celsius rise since the last ice age 20,000 years ago. So that's a big difference when we're talking about the global average temperature. I'm not talking about day-to-day -day weather, we're talking about global average temperature. For that to change by two to four degrees Celsius is a lot which is why most of the climate talks are trying to keep it at two degrees or lower because you can imagine that four degrees, which is roughly eight degrees Fahrenheit, could be catastrophic for crops and a lot of other things like sea level rise that we'll talk about some more here. Their 2007 report stated that there is a 90% probability that observed climate changes are the result of human activities. Um, and that's from 2007. We have even more evidence at this point that um, climate change is due to human activities, burning fossil fuels, changing land use. Um, so we need to talk about the sources of global carbon emissions. So we talked about climate change. Carbon emissions include both carbon dioxide and methane. Um, they both have carbon in them. And um, we see that it comes from all over the world. Um, and the number one source of these emissions is combustion, so burning things. That includes burning forests to clear land or, or burning wood. It also includes burning fossil fuels for industry, transportation, heating, and cooking. Um, and so we see these dark bars are the carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuels. Um, and so you can see that um, the largest number here is from North America. Um, a lot also comes from Europe, which has a lot of people. Um, and a lot is coming from Asia, mostly um, China and India, mostly because they have the most people. Um, and the United States has the third most people. So when you put those three places together, you get a decent amount of fossil fuel consumption. Um, you can tell this is an old graph. Um, 
But the other part is from land use changes. Um, and most of this is deforestation. A lot of it has to do with um, cutting and burning rainforest. Um, so you can see in North America, Europe, um, Russia, and Asia, um, our biggest contributors are from combustion. And when you get to South America and Africa, the biggest contributors are from land use change. Um, there is also um, more termites change. This has to do with land use changes. Um, but deforestation of the Amazon rainforest and deforestation of the Congo um, is a huge contributor um, to climate change as well. And most of that is fueled by... Um, industrial interests by Europe and North America as well. We also see more rice farming as part of these land use changes, which increases the emissions of methane. Livestock is another big part, um, mostly from the increase in emissions of methane. Um, any ruminants I mentioned before, mostly cows and sheep. Um, mostly cows really, um, are responsible for increasing the amount of methane released. So um, dairy and beef farming directly um, are part of this. Um, so it's not just driving cars. A lot of people think climate change, they think, think driving cars. It's not just driving cars. Fossil fuels are used for almost every industry we have. It's used for transportation, but it's also used for shipping goods. Um, it's used for making our electricity. Um, but also deforestation um, and livestock farming is also a very big part of this. Um, and more people. Having more people means more methane and carbon dioxide as well. Um, so we use computer models to provide evidence um, of climate change. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about these. I'm not going to expect you to know how any of these models work or know the details of these models. Um, but a lot of times in science, the best way to understand cause and effect is to do controlled experiments. Um, we can't do that. We only have one Earth. You know, if we had... Um, a large number of Earths, we could do one thing to one of them and something else to the other and get um, data on uh, what happens and understand cause and effect. But we can't do that. We only have one Earth and we definitely don't want to mess it up by doing an experiment. Um, so what we've done instead is to make complex computer models. So we try to make computer models that mimic the climate as well as possible and can simulate um, our climate um, based on uh, no natural fluctuations and human inputs. Um, and so basically they can run the models with different circumstances and they can basically do those experiments um, but do them virtually. Um, so they run lots of iterations with random variability and then they change certain things and they ask whether um, you would get something different if you made these certain changes. And that's what um, these um, climate projections, they come from these models. Um, we know that if a computer model can accurately predict the past climate, that's a good indication that it's going to be relatively effective at predicting future climate, or at least that it's simulating the climate relatively well. Um, and so what we find is that when the models are run without human inputs, so without um, burning fossil fuels from industrialization, the prediction don't match the historical climate records. So what that means is that that is very good evidence that our burning of fossil fuels and land use changes from industrialization and globalization um, are the primary cause of climate change. Um, and so these models do that and give us that information. When these models are run with human inputs from industrialization, they do predict cli historical climate records. And so this shows that. So um, blue 
lines are when the models, and you can see that there is a variability of outputs, and that's because they run these models over and over and over and over again to get an average. They don't just run it one time and accept that. They want to make sure that time after time, with variability, that you still get the same general trends. And so the blue lines are um, the models with only natural forcings. Um, that means they didn't include um, industrialization, um, human land use change, things like that. The red um, shows both natural and anthropogenic forcings. So that includes the industrialization and the land use change. And then the black lines show what we've actually observed um, for um, temperatures through time. And so you can see this shows the global temperatures and we would expect the models to do the best at the global predictions. And so you can see that using only natural forcings, um, you get this blue line here um, and the red line. And you can see that the observations, the black line matches the red line better than the blue line. If we look at the global land surface temperatures, we see the same thing. Um, and it actually even matches the land better. The ocean, you can see there is a little bit of a problem back in the 1940s, but in general, the black line still um, matches the red line better than the blue line. And we see the same thing for the data on the continents. So we see the same thing for North America, Europe, Africa, South America, Asia, and Australia. So this is good evidence that our models are working well because they're matching the current climate um, under the circumstances of having people emit um, greenhouse gases from burning fossil fuels and from land use changes.